Unit 8, Observation, Reporting, and Documentation. So the objectives of this unit, so obviously spell and define terms at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, list the components of the nursing process, and we'll talk about these in detail. Explain the responsibilities of the nurse aide of each component of the nursing process. And then describe two observations to make for each body system. The purpose of a care plan, which we'll talk about um, three times when oral reports are given, and describe information given when reporting, um, so passing off information, and then the purpose of the HIPAA laws. So the introduction. So one responsibility of the nurse aide is to collect and communicate information about patients. So we've talked about this in previous units, but you will be uh, the person that's with your patients and residents more than anybody else on the healthcare team. So you often are the first to notice if there's um, changes in behavior, changes in um, signs and symptoms. And so again, you're going to always report anything, any change in behavior or any change in treatment or response is going to be reported up the chain of command to the nurse. So you're going to collect this information and pass it along to your nurse. Sorry. Okay, so, so diagnoses, and, and there are um, really two different medical focuses here. So there's the nursing focus and the medicines focus. And you'll see there's an overlap here um, in the middle in terms of healing. So the purpose of both nurses and um, medicine, so essentially the physicians, PAs, is going to be that healing focus, whereas the medicines focus is going to be curing, so having a diagnosis, looking for a cure for whatever that issue is, whereas the nursing focus is going to be more caring. And this is really especially important to just kind of understand in terms of um, chronic disease is one example. So obviously you're not going to cure a chronic disease. So if somebody has diabetes, they will always have diabetes. And so um, the nursing aspect, the nursing focus is going to be caring for that and promoting health and wellness. So again, somebody has a chronic disease, but that they, they can live um, in a good uh, state of maintenance. So they can be on their insulin on their medications and they can have their blood sugars pretty well controlled. So again, it's the healing aspect, the caring, um, and the medicines focus is really that curing and as well as the healing. So the nursing process, so this is really important in the nursing field. So the registered nurse is responsible for achieving patient-focused care by using these five steps. The nursing process is used by every nurse in any facility. Um, basically, it's because it's a really a logical way to approach, again, that caring and healing aspect of, of the nursing diagnoses. So assessment, assessment, um, true assessment has to be performed by a registered nurse, but other healthcare team members can help Help with that process. So, for example, a nurse aide can help with the assessment process by letting the nurse know, okay, I was giving a bed bath and I noticed that there's some skin breakdown uh, on the patient's heel. So then the nurse would go in and then assess that and see, is it a stage one, stage two, where are we at in this process? So you will contribute to the assessment process by reporting your observations to the nurse, but ultimately the registered nurse is responsible for, for performing a patient assessment. So problem identification, so these are going to be referred to as nursing diagnoses. Uh, and again, the nursing diagnosis is going to focus on care and healing, a little different than a medical diagnosis. So the, nurses, um, the nursing diagnosis is going to focus on those areas, whereas the medical diagnosis is going to be more focused on curing and healing. Uh, planning, so a lot of this is going to be through a care plan, and so, you know, saying, okay, what's, what's the issue? We have some skin breakdown. What are going to be our, um, what's our plan to sort of address this issue? So is it going to be more frequent position changes? Is it going to be, um, you know, what, what is it going to be? Changing the bedding, making sure that we're being mindful of friction and sharing. And then implementation is going to be the actual interventions that we use to make sure that we're focusing on the problem. So it's going to be actually turning the patient every two hours. It's going to be, um, you know, making sure that we're keeping uh, friction and sharing away from those sensitive areas. So it's going to be all those actual interventions we perform on the patient or resident. And then evaluation, just like it sounds, is are our interventions working? So we've been repositioning the patient every two hours. Is it, um, has the skin pr breakdown progressed or has it um, stayed the same or has it gotten better? And then you go back into um, 
the cycle all over again. So these are listed in kind of a linear format, but it's really a cycle. So if you get to evaluation and you still have a problem, you're going to start right back in again with assessment and, and start through the process again. So importance of the nursing process. So if the process breaks down, patients are at high risk of injury. So again, if we're not doing good assessment, we're not able to really identify problems and work towards treating them. So it, it puts patients at risk for injury. The facility and its personnel are at high risk of legal exposure. Ultimately, if we don't follow the process, we're not doing our jobs well. So we're not finding out what's happening with the patient. We're not, you know, again, health is ever changing. And so if we're not really keeping an eye on how the the, per the patient is doing now, constant assessment of have things changed, have things gotten better, have they gotten worse, and uh, what are we going to do about it? So it's an important responsibility to understand and fulfill your own role in the process. So again, a lot of it is you're going to be the eyes and ears of, of that nurse. You're going to be in the room. You're going to be with the patients more than they are. So you need to make sure if there's any sort of changes that you let the, the nurse know if, you know, if you're seeing any sort of observations that have changed or you're doing intervention, so they've recommended that you position the patient every two hours and you've noticed some kind of a change, at that point you're going to go let the nurse know because that's going to be part of the evaluation process. So observation is information obtained by using one's senses. There's, so there's two types of observations, um, and you'll, you'll hear these um, terms used a lot in, in every healthcare facility. So subjective information. So this is going to be the statement of complaint by the patient. So I have pain in you know my stomach, or um, I feel sick to my stomach, those kinds of things. So something that the, the patient themselves is complaining of is, is stating. Whereas objective is something that is factual or measurable. So blood pressure is objective because we're able to get an actual measurement. Or urine output is objective because we're able to actually measure the urine and get a really factual measurement of what's happening. So both are really important to know um, in terms of kind of giving a good picture of, of the patient's health. But they're two different uh, ways of getting information. So to make accurate observations, um, you need to know what's normal or baseline, and that's why we it's so important when a patient is admitted that we do a really good admission assessment so we know what is normal for that patient. So, okay, they weigh 120 pounds, but what did they weigh yesterday or last week? You know, what are they weighing next week? So it's really important to have a sense of kind of is that a normal measurement for that patient? So, again, blood pressure, they're, they're 140 over 90, but you know, were they 120 over 80 last week or were they 160 over 100 last week? So is that better or worse? So understanding really what's a baseline for them is very, very important. Um, so if you're helping admit a patient, which is going to be a role as a CNA, you're going to help be making observations while you're completing the assignment. So um, and a great example of this is skin assessment. So when a person is admitted, you're going to be doing a skin assessment to see um, how is their skin. Again, it's that first line of defense we have for infection. So if we notice any areas of breakdown, if we notice bruising or something indicative of abuse, so anything that you note, you're going to always report to the nurse, and she's going to come then do an assessment. So again, really impor important to, um, to note possible signs of injury or skin breakdown, especially on admission. So if they're coming into the facility and they have a stage 3 pressure ulcer, it's a very important that the staff knows that and so you know we can create a care plan appropriate for that so pain pain is a very important um, a important uh, thing that we realize because with pain, uh, essentially there, it's always indicative of something wrong. So that doesn't mean people will uh, sometimes, um, not, you know, everyone will be in pain at some point or another. But again, it's our body's way, it's the nervous system's way of telling us something's going wrong, okay? So we never ignore the presence of pain. We always make sure if someone's um, reporting pain, we pass that information along to the nurse and we try to get a very clear picture of what what kind of pain they're in. Um, the most important um, way to sort of evaluate pain is the patient's self-report of pain. So again, that's really important, potentially on your exam, um, but the patient's self-report of pain is the most important indicator. So if you ask them, they say, okay, 
you know, I have a headache, you're then going to ask them, okay, on, on the pain scale, you know, 1 to 10, what is your pain level right now? If they say 10 out of 10, you're going to then go report that to the nurse that they've said 10 out of 10. So if the patient's sitting there laughing, hanging out, saying 10 out of 10, and you're thinking, well, they don't seem to be in pain, again, the most important indicator of pain is the patient's self-report of pain. So people have a really... Um, a really huge variation in how they respond to pain and pain level intolerance and so patient self-report of pain is the most important indicator. So you never try to judge whether a patient really has pain or the severity of the pain. What we're going to ask them is for them to respond to a pain scale so we have a really good um, picture of kind of what what their pain is. Um, and so just making sure that you always report pain to the nurse and then not only that, so that the nurse, that you report pain to the nurse, the nurse now medicates that patient for the pain. You're going to go back in later and check in and make sure that the patient now, their pain has, is better. So you're going to ask them again on the pain scale, okay, so now the nurse gave you um, morphine, so what's your pain scale now? And so hopefully it was a 10, maybe now it's a 6, you're going to go report that back to the nurse that, okay, they're showing improvement. So again, it's not just a one-step process, it's going to be ongoing. So confidentiality and privacy. So you've all done your HIPAA quiz um, for Lutheran Medical Center as well as uh, the one we do in class, so I'm sure we've sort of beat this to death, but HIPAA of 1996, it really, um, the purpose of this was to increase patient control over personal medical records. There had been some examples of um, of breaches of confidentiality. So one popular example was with um, a celebrity and essentially they'd been treated for a medical issue and you know I think there were several hundred people who had observed their medical records. So again not a need to know, they just wanted to know because the person was famous. So it's just it, it just brought about attention to the fact that really um, patients should have control over their personal medical records, have confidentiality and you know, confidentiality and privacy related to their health records. So it restricts the use and disclosure of patient information. So again, the, the thing to just keep remembering with HIPAA is the person has to have a need to know to do their job for them to have that disclosure of patient information. So if it's a respiratory therapist and they need to know that information to perform their job, then that's an appropriate person. So somebody who's just curious or wants to know if it's not related to a need for their job, then that's an appropriate disclosure of information. So it makes facilities accountable, accountable for protecting patient data. So you have to have passwords on computers. There have to be locked files. Um, you're going to be using shredders to get rid of patient information. So confidential, confidential information is in, isn't out there in the public. So facilities um, are required to implement and monitor information for release policies and procedures. So how information is released is also protected, and there should be policies and procedures. So patients should be signing something that's saying they, they are aware that their information is being released. Um, and then it's it's really the individually uh, identifiable health health information, and so kind of knowing what is that specific information. Can I pass along a patient diagnosis? Can I pass along these different things? So you'll see that now that there's some safeguards too, where they used to put patients' names, their diagnosis up on a big whiteboard right on the the floor in a hospital, for example. And now they've had to limit that information. So. They can put, you know, essentially some of that information, but not all of it. So you can't have all of that patient's identifiable health information in public. So you can have room numbers and names, things like that, um, but you're not going to have their associated diagnosis up in public view. So this applies to any form of um, documentation or information, so paper, verbal, electronic, billing records, and clinical records. So one important thing to remember is when you're discussing patient information, you need to be mindful of how you're discussing that information and are you doing your best to make sure that it's not overheard by other people or when there is other types of paper um, electronic documentation, are you safeguarding that information so it can't be released to just anybody who's, who's interested? 
So reporting, so this is going to um, be a really part of, important part of your job too. And we talk about in Chapter 7, communication, uh, such an important piece of that is going to be an oral report. So it's a, it's a way to relay information from one person to another. So when their shift changes, so for example in the hospital, you have your 12-hour shift. When you pass on to the next shift, you want to make sure in that oral report you're passing along anything important that that person would need to know about your shift so they can um, build upon that so there's not really this loss of information from shift to shift. It should really be a seamless process where um, the patients are always well taken care of. So the information is passed along to the next shift. They now take on that responsibility and so they have what they need to perform their job. So an example is, you know, Mr. Jones's blood pressure um, all of a sudden, you know, jumped up and was now 180 over 100. He's been medicated, you know, this and that. Whatever information, whatever happened that would be important information for them to know. And the reason why it's important to do it orally rather than, you know, for some facilities do still do that where they have a recorded message, but orally gives that other person an opportunity to ask questions. So, okay, well, was there anything that, in uh, a change in status for Mr. Jones, or is he, you know, has he been on other medications before, or whatever it is that they want to ask to clarify, so clarify, clarifying questions. Um, so the nurse aide may participate in oral ports several times a shift, so you may be having, again, at shift change, that's obviously one time, but you may be having other staff come in and change. You may be reporting to a nurse. You may be reporting, they may be transferring a patient to another um, floor. You may be reporting to that CNA. So again, um, you also may be just reporting shift, or um, I'm sorry, behavior changes or, or physical changes. So just always being open to more communication is better than less. And if, you, if you're not sure if it's something they need to know, especially in the beginning, it's always better to provide more information and they may say, okay, that's great, I don't need to know that information, but it's better than them needing to know and you're off shift now and so they can't access that information. So charting guidelines, this is very important. The most important thing to remember is that a patient's medical record is a legal document that may be used in court as evidence. So when you're documenting in there, always be mindful. Okay, I'm writing this in here. This could be used in a court of law. It's a legal document, okay? So everything must be correct, obviously, and legible. So, you know, there's that whole... Um, thought of a uh, physician's handwriting so you can't understand what they're saying you know it's not legible so just uh, it's you know, you never, you don't want to have that be the case. You wanted to make sure that anything that you're saying is really legible. And you, you'll find that now that if you don't understand something, you need to make sure that you follow up with whoever wrote that down. Because again, we're, we're having um, res uh, treatment plans. We're doing things based on, on documentation. And so we need to make sure we understand it's correct and clear so that we can do our jobs appropriately. So um, all charting and records must be in clear, simple, and accurate language. So if you're using abbreviations, make sure that they're approved abbreviations for your facility. So often they have do not use abbreviation lists that come out periodically where they say these are confusing because in cardiology it may mean one thing and gastroenterology it may mean something else. So making sure it's clear, simple, and accurate. Um, and then charting is the process of recording the patient's care, their response to treatment, and their progress in the patient's chart. And again, there's this kind of rule with documentation is if it's not documented, it wasn't done. So again, it's really important that we write down what, what we have done, what, what has happened, because the, other, the next shift is going to assume it's not done if it's not written down. So you know, if you didn't say that Mr. Jones had a bowel movement this shift and it's been two days since his previous one, they may start medicating him. They may start giving him stool softeners and other kinds of things because they don't know that he's had a bowel movement. So it's very important to pass that information along um, because you need to make sure that they know that this has happened because that is going to give them, that's going to change their response to treatment or how they're going to go about um, treating the patient.